Uh, welcome, everyone, um, uh, to the Ride Sharing Institute's uh, webinar on disruptive innovations in ride sharing. Uh, my name is Larry Filler, and I will be the moderator for today. Uh, and we have a very interesting program uh, for you, so you can hear about some of the new ventures into shared ride services and their relationship to ride sharing. Before we uh, begin, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, so I'm Larry Filler, and uh, I am director, regional director of Urban Trans North America, a multimodal TDM planning and uh, and uh, services company. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a number of other experts on the panel. Uh, before we uh, begin, I'd just like to introduce uh, the Ride Sharing Institute to those of you who may be unfamiliar with it. Uh, we can go to the slide on the Ride Sharing Institute. Uh, there we go. Anyway, the Ride Sharing Institute is a relatively new organization dedicated to supporting the use of ride sharing, including transit. One of our goals is to double the use of carpooling and van pooling during commuting hours from about 10% today to 20% back to where it was in the early 80s. Our activities are focused on research, education, policy development, and advocacy. This webinar, which is the second in a series of webinars we are running on new topics in ride sharing, are part of what we do. We depend on our members to help us with these programs and other activities. For those interested in joining us and becoming part of this exciting exciting. Uh, venture, I invite you to visit our website at ridesharinginstitute.org and become members. I also want to thank the Winters and the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida for hosting this webinar, and thanks to our additional partners, AMPO, FHWA, FPA, ACT, APTA, ITS America, National Transportation Operations Coalition, and TDM Institute. The topic for today's webinar is Disruptive Innovations in Ride Sharing, and we have seen already that this program has generated a lot of discussion on the TDM listserv and elsewhere. I am very pleased that we have a distinguished and varied panel of experts to explore these innovations. Here to begin the discussion is Susan Shaheen. Susan is co-director of the Institute of Transportation Studies, Transportation Sustainability Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. She's also an associate adjunct professor in civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. She's held several senior positions in transportation and transportation research and has authored numerous reports and articles on car sharing, parking management, and ride sharing, among others. Susan? Thank you so much, Phil. All right, so, and don't worry uh, for hosting us today. So I am just looking for my PowerPoint. I see a a poll up. There we go. So uh, again, thanks so much to uh, Phil Winters and to the National Center for Transit Research at the Center for Urban Transportation at University of Southern Florida for hosting this along with our co-sponsors and also Larry for the introduction. I am going to be uh, presenting on a paper that I co-authored with Nelson Chan in 2011 in Transport Reviews titled Ride Sharing in North America, Past, Present, and Future. At the end of the presentation, I will be covering developments uh, in ride matching that have occurred in the past year or so and have attracted a lot of attention and some might even say controversy. This is a presentation overview. What I'm going to start with is problem definition, you know, why are we interested in ride sharing and its overall motivation. Then I'll discuss uh, some background on ride sharing, some relevant definitions because you'll, you'll find, particularly as we get into the controversy part, definitions seem to be really important to navigating our way through this. Cover the history of ride sharing. Uh, Nelson and I came up with a framework of five phases. Discuss the recent developments cover some of the key questions that uh, arose during the California Public Utilities Commission workshop that was held on April 10th and 11th in San Francisco, so this is pretty fresh information, and conclude with some factors that I think we might want to consider as we move forward. So as all of you know, there's a lot of uh, effects of traffic congestion, and <clears throat> you can see here 
from uh, the TTI Annual Urban Mobility Report in 2012, it was estimated in 2011 that emissions related to congestion were 56 billion pounds of CO2 emitted or carbon dioxide emitted, 2.9 billion gallons of fuel was wasted, 5.5 billion hours of extra time was wasted as a result of congestion, and the cost of delay in fuel was estimated in 2011 dollars at 121 billion. There's lots of benefits associated with ride sharing and carpooling, and those include reduced parking demand, cost savings, time savings, in addition to fuel savings and emissions reductions. Many people um, have been concerned about carpooling over the years, and while there's many benefits, some have been disinclined to uh, participate in carpooling, in part because they didn't want to sacrifice flexibility and convenience to private vehicle ownership. Other factors that have been noted in the literature include concerns about personal security, as well as desires for personal space. So that's uh, some brief uh, background on ride sharing. So clearly, it's a powerful strategy to address problems of congestion and emissions and, and fuel use. And it's really a simple concept. The idea is to fill empty seats and use our vehicle occupancy much better and reduce the number of vehicles on the road. But still, it only constitutes approximately 11% of the modal split. It's definitely distinct from taxis and limos, and the driver's motivation in a more classic ride-sharing situation is it's a nonprofit uh, arrangement, and oftentimes it's partially covering the driver's expense. Another distinction is, is that the passenger has a common origin destination to the driver. In the next slide, I go over uh, some definitions that uh, we found in the literature, and Phil actually helped uh, to provide the first one from the Florida regulations. And here I just want to emphasize that between these two definitions, uh, the first is from Florida, the second is from the California Public Utilities Commission, that they highlight things like common destination, round trip, home and work locations. And the California Public Utilities Commission says that you know, ride sharing is exempt from charter party regulations if it constitutes um, a carpool or a ride-sharing arrangement. Charter uh, party carriers are defined at the bottom of the slide, and they typically include uh, limiting companies and sightseeing companies, and their trips are prearranged. At present in California, the Public Utilities Commission has oversight for charter party carriers, and this includes things like making sure that there's insurance for liability as well as workers' compensation, inspection for vehicles with seats over 10, driver's licensing for commercial licensing, and drug and alcohol testing. Forms of uh, Common forms of ride sharing include carpooling, and carpooling is usually a grouping of travelers into a private automobile. It can be acquaintance-based, for instance, a family pool or a uh, group traveling uh, to and from school, organization-based, and it can also include casual carpooling or slugging. And the other uh, common form is van pooling, and this typically is uh, a group of people sharing a ride in a van, uh, commuting to and from an employment center. The third area of definition is this commercial for higher transportation, and the reason I throw this in early on is I think it will help as we um, have a discussion about current controversy and debate about what's happening in the ride-sharing space. So taxi cabs operate without prearrangement pre and they hail at the curb. And as I mentioned before, charter party carriers are essentially um, arranging trips that are prearranged in advance and uh, they include limiting companies and say sightseeing companies. The next slide uh, provides a schematic of the five phases that Nelson and I um, developed for the paper that I'm presenting. I will go over each one of the phases in more detail in the slides that follow. So in the first slide, uh, you'll see 
we've got uh, the World War II car sharing clubs phase. And this goes from essentially 1942 to 1945. Ride sharing began during the World War II era through car sharing clubs. Not to be confused with uh, car sharing as we know it today, but actually as carpooling. And when I say car, share, car sharing as we know it today, I'm referring to services that pr provide access to short-term auto use, such as city car sharing in San Francisco, Zipcar. And this is actually referring to carpooling. Uh, a 1942 U.S. regulation required that ride sharing t uh, to work um, was indeed a requirement when there was no other alternative transportation means available. And the U.S. Office of Civilian Defense asked that neighborhood councils encourage that four workers share a ride in one car to conserve rubber for the war effort. In the next slide, you can see that it, uh, this system created a ride-sharing ride program called the Car Sharing Club Exchange and Self-Dispatching Service. This was a precursor to today's Internet notice boards, and the system matched riders and drivers via a bulletin board at work. Factories and companies were responsible for forming these clubs. And here's an example of a bulletin board that was posted at work. Next, we move into phase two, which is essentially the late 1960s to the late 1980s. And the focus here really was on managing congestion and parking in the late 1960s, as you can see. But then it shifts in the 1970s from a parking supply focus to an energy conservation focus. The 1970 for Emergency Highway Energy Conservation Act allowed for federal highway funds to go to over 100 carpool demonstration programs in 96 metropolitan areas, and this went through 1977. In 1975, the Federal Highway Administration began publishing guidebooks on carpooling and vanpooling, as you can see, and the U.S. DOT then established the National Ride Sharing Demonstration Program in 1979 with the objective of increasing ride-sharing by 5%. <clears throat> As part of the National Ride-Sharing Program, the U.S. DOT and the Department of Energy developed computerized ride-matching services. Other ride-sharing strategies included um, HOV lanes or high-occupancy vehicle lanes, casual carpooling, park-and-ride facilities, as well as van pooling. Next slide, we move into phase three, which is 1980 to 1997. And this uh, shifts from energy conservation and its focus to improving congestion and air quality. This third phase involved employer-based trip reduction, or what's known as EBTR programs. And it was really the beginnings of automated ride matching. In the 1980s, suburban office parks began using trip reduction ordinances, or TROs, to encourage commute alternatives to driving alone. One type of TRO was a mandatory EBTR program that was employed in Pleasanton, California in 1984. This TRO limited peak hour solo driving to no more than 55% of the daytime workforce. Pleasanton's TRO, however, resulted in only a moderate increase in carpooling and van pooling. Air quality districts also began implementing similar employer-based trip reduction programs. And in December of 1987, the Southern California Air Quality Management District passed Regulation 15, which was the largest mandatory EBRT, EBTR program in the U.S., which affected over 3.8 million workers. A 1998 study uh, written by Jennifer Dill found that most of the programs failed because there was no clear definition of the program. Was it addressing congestion, parking supply, or air quality? This was not clear. Jennifer also notes, as a lesson learned, that these programs had unrealistic targets. During the 1990s, we move into a phase of telephone-based ride matching programs. Examples in this area include the Bellevue Smart Traveler Program, the Los Angeles 
Smart Traveler, and Sacramento's Rideshare Express. However, the programs were deemed unsuccessful due to low usage rates. Indeed, Bellevue only had six logged ride matches. Los Angeles Smart Traveler had an average of 34 weekly users and only 20% chance of successful ride matching. After these telephone pilots failed, several enhanced programs were proposed. These added new technologies that were now available, including Internet, GIS, and email capabilities. And they formed the basis of many ride-sharing programs that we see today. The next phase we call Phase 4, Reliable Ride-Sharing Systems. And this is um, spanning a period of 1994 to 2004. We use the term reliable here because these systems targeted commuters with regular re reliable trip schedules. These systems were realized through online ride matching, which is popular interface today. Since 1999, private software companies began developing ride matching pro platforms, providing their suite of services to clients for a monthly fee. However, carpools formed through online ride matching tended to be more static and inflexible and required pre-arrangement, which leads us to our final phase in our uh, journal article titled five, Phase 5, which spans 2004 to the present, or perhaps we need to re, uh, address this phase, but it, it takes us up to about 2011 per our paper. And this phase can be uh, categorized as technology-enabled ride matching. And at the time we published the paper, most American ride matching services were using online websites at that time. There are four key developments that occurred during this phase. Partnerships between ride matching software companies and large-scale clients took advantage of existing common destinations and are still today, and a large number of potential members. These firms sell their ride matching software platforms to public agencies and employers and sometimes use a standalone website for each group. This strategy has gained more users than previous ride-sharing phases, but it is still most suited for commuters who have regular schedules. Many public agencies and companies promote ride-sharing by providing its members with incentives. Incentives include reward points or drawings for members who carpool, vanpool, take transit, walk, or bike. And finally, the rise of the social uh, networking or social media platforms, such as Facebook, have enabled ride-sharing companies to use this interface to match potential rides between friends. These companies hope that the social networking will build trust among participants as well. I will address the more recent developments in the areas of ride matching and dispatching in greater detail in about two slides. And this is a slide uh, based on an extensive literature review search that Nelson and I conducted. And it uh, summarizes that as of July 2011, we found over 638 ride matching services in North America. In this tally, the institutions that have their own ride matching websites but employ a common platform were each counted separately. This tally also includes both online and offline carpooling and vanpooling programs. Those located in sparsely populated rural areas, which appeared to have very low use, however, were excluded. Of the total, 401 were located in the U.S., 261 in Canada, and 24 programs spanned both countries. As you can see, carpooling attracts the largest focus, with 621 programs offering carpooling, carpool ride matching, 153 providing vanpool ride matching, and 127 offering both. So as I mentioned, in the next slide, I'm going to move into some of the more recent developments. And so what we've seen is a lot of activity in what many companies are referring to as ride, you know, real-time ride matching services. Essentially, they match drivers and passengers based on destination through a smartphone app before the trip is to take place. Typically really short trips, in-city trips, cashless payment is facilitated through the app, and a credit card that's uh, provided on file. There's usage-based rating systems, uh, social media style rating systems for people to uh, 
look at uh, driver and passenger behavior, and they differ from dispatching or e-hail models that do not require that a person provide a destination in advance. So in terms of the recent controversy, uh, Nelson Chan and I at uh, UC Berkeley have been tracking this actively and have tried to put together a couple of slides to summarize uh, this activity for you. So many of the new startups that have these app-based uh, services are asserting that they are not transportation companies, for instance, like a, a charter uh, a third, or, or charter, uh, I'm sorry, I've got a cold here, uh, the charter party carrier system, but they are technology companies that provide a ride matching platform. The drivers do not need to have a commercial license if they fall under the ride sharing exemption of commercial transportation regulations. So this is where the terminology of ride sharing is really coming into play because if these companies are eligible for a ride-sharing ride exemption, that means there would be no governmental regulations for safety and insurance that are imposed on taxi and limo companies. So the big question is, do startups fall under this ride-sharing definition? Are their drivers not for profit? Are the shared trips already along the driver's route? Or are some of these services more like peer-to-peer -peer, uh, taxi services or community driver services? So these are some key questions that uh, are part of this controversy. In this next slide, I provide an overview of some recent developments. And you can see in 2012, there's a lot of activity occurring in California. And you see in August, the California Public Utilities Commission releases a cease and desist order on the company's Lyft, Sidecar, and Tick and & Go. And later in November, uh, imposes a $20,000 fine for Lyft, Sidecar, and Uber. And Sidecar expands in November outside of California to Seattle. Following in December, the California Public Utilities Commission begins order instituting rulemaking and issues that to better regulate new companies. And you can see in February, there's a lot of expansion activity occurring. Sidecar expands into Austin, acquires Hayride, Philly, Los Angeles, and Uber uh, X, which is a ride-sharing component of Uber, launches in San Francisco. In February, Austin releases a cease and desist notice for Sidecar, and in Philadelphia, impounds three of the Sidecar vehicles. Sunil Paul is on our panel today, and I'm sure he'd be happy to address uh, some of these actions and uh, his experiences through these recent developments. You can see in January, Lyft and Uber enter into inter interim agreements with the California Public Utilities Commission to continue their operations throughout the OIR process. And Lyft expands into Los Angeles in January. In March, Lyft uh, acquires Cherry, which is an on-demand car washing service. Sidecar expands into Boston, Brooklyn, Chicago, and D.C. And Sidecar and Uber X give free rides. And Lyft does publicity at the South by Southwest conference in Austin. And I believe they had planned to offer services there, but they were not allowed to. And now moving into April, uh, the San Francisco Airport International, Op International Airport issues a cease and desist order for Lyft, Sidecar, Take and Go, Instant Cab, and Uber. In April, uh, studies suggest that San Francisco, through uh, SFMTA, and Timothy Pompandreo is on the panel as well. He might be able to discuss this. Adds, suggests adding 600 to 800 more taxis to the existing fleet of over, I think, 1,600 taxis in San Francisco today. And Lyft uh, expands into Seattle. And as I noted earlier, uh, just last week, April 10th and 11th, the California Public Utilities Commission held a workshop. So during this uh, process, the California Public Utilities Commission issued this order instituting rulemaking, which is intended to create regulations to protect public safety and promote innovation in passenger transportation. 
In February, they held a pre-hearing conference to determine all parties that are impacted and involved in this process and discuss the scope of the rulemaking and workshops that they had planned. In April, just last week, they held the participatory workshops to draft the report for the administrative law judge's review and decision. The workshops clarified each party's position, discussed issues of jurisdiction, safety, insurance, competition, and innovation, and posed possible regulatory responses to new online enabled transportation services, which is what uh, the California Public Utilities Commission is referring to these new services as. My understanding is that this meeting got quite contentious um, at several points and about 30 to 35 people intended, attended the meeting across um, the first day and second day. Key questions that arose from the workshop are noted here, including do these range of services fall under the definition of ride sharing? Should a monetary cap be imposed on the amount that drivers can earn? What new regulations should be enacted? Should there even be new regulations? Interestingly, in uh, March of 2013, the Federal Trade Commission showed concern to the Colorado Public Utilities Commission, stating that there, they may impair competition in the area of passenger vehicle transportation services and recommended a regulatory framework that was flexible to accommodate these new app-based transportation services. Safety is another key question Are companies checks adequate for safety and licensing? Are regulations needed for standardization and oversight? In terms of licensing, should there be a new licensing model for privately owned vehicles, for peer-to-peer -peer drivers or community drivers? In terms of insurance, should some have excess liability insurance and what are the details associated with that? Should proprietary information be disclosed to the public through this process? And do these companies ultimately add or remove vehicles or add or reduce emissions? Final factors to consider include the popularity of these services, that many of these services appear to be filling some unmet need. They're, they're growing very rapidly. There's a social dimension to them. There's the appeal of social media and peer-to-peer -peer services and the use of smartphones. Scalability. Ride sharing has always had concerns about critical mass. And can the, these types of app based services help to create that critical mass? An area that I study actively is public bike sharing or a form of public um, transportation for bikes. And in the history of public bike sharing, I think it's important to note that when it was first deployed in 1965 in Amsterdam through a free white bike system, the 50 bikes were either confiscated by the police or disappeared almost immediately. And the goal of those bike sharing services to provide reliable trips so people could actually use these for commute trips or regular trips was unrealized because they were not reliable. And today we see the growth and spread of public bike sharing throughout cities in North America and across the world. And we would argue that some of the success is due to the fact that they employ IT technology, which makes them reliable systems and have allowed them to scale so that people can actually use these for day-to-day -day trip making. In terms of evolution, question is, is you know, how will real-time ride matching or these app-based services evolve in the future? Could community drivers or peer-to-peer -peer drivers enable more real-time ride matching in the future? We think there's a need for a framework to categorize the spectrum of services that are out there, ranging from ride matching all the way to taxi dispatching, that account for profit potential as well as the real-time nature of these services. What's the best way to encourage these innovations is a question we ask. Should they be shut down? Should they be constrained? Or should they be promoted on a minimal level to protect public safety? We also strongly believe that research is needed into the safety and economic impacts, as well as the potential for con 
congestion reduction and emissions as we move forward. And I wanted to conclude with a reference and final acknowledgement to Nelson Chan of the paper from which the majority of this presentation was based. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was uh, excellent. Uh, it was really an interesting framing of all the issues. Um, and we have uh, today uh, someone who will talk about uh, some of those from a uh, from an own business perspective. But um, before we do so, I've been asked that we can uh, do a quick poll just to make sure we have a better understanding of who's attending today. So if you look on your screen, you will see um, a, uh, the first poll, uh, which is um, asking how, where are you viewing the uh, webinar, uh, how many people are viewing the webinar. Uh, today at your location. So if you could take a quick moment and just click on the, uh, the appropriate uh, number, uh, and we can just quickly see uh, how many people are doing that. Okay. And then the second poll is uh, just describing your organization. You can see people are just filling out quickly. Great. Oh, okay. Even distribution of some. Great. I think uh, I think that's a good. Why don't we uh, 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 only finish there? The other thing I'd just like to say before we move on to our next uh, panelist is uh, the materials you're seeing today. The presentations are available uh, for download on the uh, right um, right side, the top of your school. Excuse me. It's another. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize they put up another poll. Okay. To what extent have you served as a driver or rider on an on-demand ride-sharing service like Hard Park? Quickly put that in. I think this is the last one. Not at all. Okay, most people. All right. Uh, I think that's the last poll. And so, uh, as I was saying, if you would like copies of the presentations you're seeing today, um, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, you see three um, sort of paper images. If you click on that, you can then download the uh, material. And the second thing is that um, as now we're getting into more of the sort of controversial part of the agenda, if uh, you uh, have questions you would like to ask, you click on the Q&A and just send your question. Um, I will then um, try to take as many questions as we can at the end of the presentations and have the panelists address that. Okay, so why don't we now uh, go to our next panelist. Uh, um, and uh, we're going to turn to one of the leaders of an emerging group of new services that uses technology to partner people for rides in real time. So Neil Paul is CEO of Sidecar Technologies, Inc., an innovative transportation software company. He's also a founding director of Spring Ventures and a member of the board of Zynga. His foundation co-founded with Facebook the Global Clean Web Initiative to promote the use of information technology for sustainability. Sunil also has extensive experience in public policy development, uh, including serving as a policy analyst at the U.S. Congress's Office of Technology Assessment. Sunil? Uh, thank you, Larry and Phil. Appreciate the invitation to uh, to talk today. Um, I wanted to um, walk through the story of Sidecar and uh, and share some of the some of the learnings that we've um, we've achieved over the you know really just a little over a year that uh, we've been active. Um, the the story of Sidecar really goes back all the way back to 1997 when I had first moved to San Francisco. Um, and between me and my wife, we only had one car. Um, and one day after I was waiting uh, for her to pick me up, um, uh, I have to say my, my first thought after waiting 15 or 20 minutes was, we need to buy another car. <laughs> um, but after... Uh, sitting there and thinking a little bit, uh, had a little extra time, I realized that someday my phone is going to know where I am. And <laughs> all the people driving by, all of their phones will know where they are. And so someday it's going to be possible to rethink transportation. Um, 
I actually considered uh, launching a company on uh, the basis of those ideas and uh, decided not to um, for three reasons. One was that I didn't think uh, the technology was ready. Second was I didn't think that there was actually consumer demand uh, for these new ideas. Uh, this was the era of 99 cent gasoline. It was pre-9-11. It was pre-concerns about climate change. And and finally, I didn't think that there was political will to support. I had learned from academics like Bob Severos uh, the difficulty in advancing innovations in transportation and how easy it is for the incumbents, the taxi cab companies and, and others, to shut down new innovations in, in transportation. So that kind of, um, frankly, scared me away from that whole category. And um, I did, however, get a patent in 2002 that relates to, to the whole space. So, um, you know, fast forward to 2007, the iPhone comes out, um, realize that there is an opportunity to, to start rethinking transportation. Um, I was involved in, in peer-to-peer car sharing. Um, I taught the class at Singularity University that resulted in uh, the, the, those students of mine created um, Get Around, a peer-to-peer car sharing company. I also um, helped get a law passed in California that's now been copied in um, Oregon and Washington. Um, uh, in California, it's called AB 1871, uh, and it basically takes inspiration from ride sharing and uh, uses acknowledges the creation of new technology to allow for peer-to-peer car sharing. And I think we've seen that in California that uh, world has has uh, has taken off. It's attracted a lot of um, innovative thinking in that category. Um, the idea behind um, creating a ride matching platform for peer-to-peer car sharing um, uh, came about in... Um, sort of a little over a year ago, we started thinking about it and starting to experiment with it. Um, And we're motivated by the realization that if we can uh, rethink transportation properly, we can not only uh, deliver something interesting that, you know, we personally want to be able to use, but that it's possible to literally replace your personal car with just a smartphone app, and using these new techniques, we can create a transportation system that is more sustainable, less emissions, that reduces congestion and makes better use of public infrastructure. Um, It's good for people's pocketbooks because it can be a lower cost and, and therefore better for the economy. And we knew that looking at uh, existing systems like casual carpool um, and or slug lines uh, that safety was a fundamental concern. So we passed we you know uh, in, in the spirit of startups and um, and fast pivots to try to figure out what a good solution is. We really honed in on how do we create a system that is very convenient for. Uh, riders to use, and I think we just heard from from Susan how important convenience is in actually creating uh, the appropriate innovations that that can scale in this category. And we have scaled uh, quite well. Um, uh, We announced late last year that we had matched 100,000 rides, uh, almost all of those in the Bay Area. Uh, We've now expanded to a total of, of nine cities. And despite that, significant scale up, we are still very small. Uh, Casual carpool in just the Bay Area over just the Bay Bridge uh, delivers 5,000 rides per day, uh, way beyond our uh, uh, the, the scale that we're operating at. And those rides happen with no uh, real accountability for any person, with no... Um, no rating system, no background checks, no proof of insurance, no proof of uh, uh, that you know the car belongs to the, to the person. And uh, the system that we created works very simply. You download the, the smartphone app, and then there's two different experiences depending on whether you're a rider or a driver. 
if you are a writer, you indicate uh, where you are going, and that request goes out to um, drivers. And when you're matched up with someone, you see their information. You also have choice over who you can be matched up with. Um, for a driver, you have to first go through a um, basically a safety check of background check. Um, um, we have two different types of background checks we do. Um, we keep copies of driver's license and uh, and confirm registration and and uh, insurance and uh, and then finally, once you're actually in uh, in the experience, each party rates the other side um, so that there is uh, the opportunity to, to sort of remove people who are not. Um, you know, this is we've designed a community of people who are respectful to one another and. Um, and if you start getting low ratings, you, you ultimately won't be able to use the service. I think the proof in the pudding that we have created something safe is that our core user demographic are young 20-something women. Exactly the opposite demographic you'd expect if this was an unsafe service. As we've, um, as we've rolled this out, We've seen a lot of confusion and concern in uh, the regulatory world. Uh, in California, Austin, and Philadelphia, uh, we've seen action being taken by them, and also at, at uh, San Francisco Airport, SFO. And in each one of these, it's been a different, uh, sort of a different course of action. And as you can imagine, each one of these situations is unique because they are uh, local and and creates quite a significant obstacle for us as a company. Uh, we estimate that we've this was an estimate made early part of this year that we've already spent five hundred thousand dollars dealing with regulatory um, engagement and uh, all the different things that we do to to sort of uh, uh, as a result of of this regulatory effort and. It's a significant drain and slowdown of, of the kind of innovation that we can deliver. Um, nevertheless, we are not knee-jerk libertarians. We are not saying that there is no role for government. We think that there is an appropriate role uh, for government. And we think that there are useful analogies out there for what types of uh, how we can create tremendous innovation and make a system that is better for consumers and better for uh, cities uh, and, and society um, using these kinds of innovations. One example is voice over IT. Voice over IT is a, you know, arguably one of the most profound and beneficial things that's happened for um, telephone service. The initial reaction by react by regulators was, hey, that's voice, that's under our jurisdiction, we want control over it, and it took many years to make it clear that uh, it is in the interest of society that voice over IP be allowed to continue to innovate and continue to uh, deliver its benefits. And we can go into all the details there, but the, the bottom line is that it, it, um, it did take a, a long time after there. In California, we've gone through a, uh, a regulatory process of Recognizing that this is a new, a new medium and we need a new set of rules for it. And we're pleased that California has taken that route because, uh, like most jurisdictions, California started with an attitude of, this is illegal, we're going to shut you down. And they have moved to an attitude of, we get it, this is new, let's think it through rationally and get input and do it in a public fashion. In the case of Austin, Texas, um, uh, they sent us a cease and desist. We looked at their um, uh, rules and, and uh, decided that uh, because of sort of the nature of the facts there, we needed to sue the city and the transportation department. And we have um, filed that suit. We've uh, had our first court date. Uh, we'll find out soon whether or not the temporary um, restraining order will um, will go our way, but regardless, we will continue to fight that uh, fight and push back on what we see as uh, overreaching and inappropriate 
uh, uh, rules created by the city of Boston. Uh, in Philadelphia, we saw very aggressive action as well, and uh, we're continuing to work and engage with Philadelphia officials and uh, civic leaders there uh, to make clear what it is that we do. Um, Susan also touched on the federal goal here. Uh, it's clear that uh, we are uh, a company that operates in lots of different jurisdictions, and there is an important role um, for the federal government to support this innovation because it is an inter um, uh, it is an activity that involves uh, interstate commerce. We've seen the Federal Trade Commission step in on the behalf of, um, in the case of Colorado PUC, uh, on the side of fairness and competition and encouraging innovation. Uh, we have said in our comments to the California PUC that there are important provisions out of the Federal Telecom Act of 1996 that uh, you know also happen to apply to things like voice over IP that are I important uh, for looking at right matching services and and the level of jurisdiction that that California and others have over it, and we think that uh, other other entities are also uh, important players here. An important distinction between what Sidecar does and how the others in the category uh, is very important to understand. We are a matching platform, which is different than a dispatching platform. The difference is as different as Match.com compared to Arrange Marriage. In a matching platform, a third party allows uh, riders and drivers to publish their information to a platform and the rider and driver retain choice over where, uh, over uh, who they will match up with. In a dispatching platform, a third party takes control over, uh, over a situation and basically uh, assigns rider and driver to one another. In order to have a matching platform, you have to have a shared destination and I would put to you that, and to the, the folks on this call, that in order to be, in order to at least get the, everyone's calling themselves ride share, in order to get the benefits of ride share, you need to have a shared destination. You need to have choice by the uh, parties, um, and otherwise you're not <laughs> going to have these, these, uh, um, benefits of reduced congestion, uh, improved sustainability, and, um, and also a higher safety level. Um, so we set out on this journey with the idea that we're going to fundamentally rethink and and, um, and change transportation in a major way. We think peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, I'm sorry, peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing is uh, an important and vital uh, step in being able to uh, create that transformation. The DNA of this company is how do we displace personal car ownership with a sidecar app? And we know that there will be others that will follow in that, in that vision. And we think that's a good thing. This is, uh, we think just the beginning of, of a, of a significant transformation. And we need the uh, input and support of, of many others to uh, to help make it happen. So I will uh, wrap it up there. Thank you for uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, Sunil. Um, it's very interesting. And uh, our final panelist, uh, is someone who has a different perspective uh, from a, a city, uh, and that's uh, uh, Timothy Papandrio. He, uh, Timothy is the Deputy Director for Sustainable Streets, Strategic Planning and Policy at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, or MUNI an agency that oversees all modes of transportation in the city and for the management of parking and streets. Timothy has worked for public and private agencies in the transportation and land use planning field for over 15 years, both in the U.S. and Australia. As a sustainable mobility expert, Timothy likes to say he walks or bikes to talk. He lives car-free in San Francisco now and did the same in L.A. for almost nine years. Timothy? 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for hosting this webinar. It's been very timely, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions and um, conf equal amount of questions as there are confusion about what's going on and um, what we want to do. So I'm going to give just a quick overview of what we're doing as, as our agency, and then we can have some leave some time for the discussion on the the, the key issues that that we're grappling with, and I think um, Dr. Shaheen and uh, Sunil really framed two very important pieces of this, and I'm going to talk about how does it actually how does it actually impact our system as as the, the as a city agency that has to deal with these things, because we're kind of uh, held by two rules right now. We have the City requirements, we also have a state requirements, and I'm just going to um, walk through what, how we look at it as, as an agency, which is very different to how many agencies look at it. So um, this is by, by, by all means not the norm. So we're a multimodal agency, and what that means is for many people who read this, oh, um, you're the Muni. Well, actually, we're more than Muni. We actually manage all the streets in San Francisco. Basically, the second you walk out of your house or your business, the public right-of-way is our domain. And that didn't happen because we were smart and clever. That happened because our citizens were so frustrated with the bifurcation and fragmentation of our transportation delivery that they put in a ballot California style and said, we want one agency that does everything for transportation, and we want them to do better than what we have right now. And it's been an integration over, over an, an evolutionary period. It hasn't really been revolutionary. It's been more in, uh, evolutionary. And while, you know, most people outside the public sector look at this and say, duh, this is common sense, I have to be very clear to people who are not familiar with this world that this is radical. So what you think of radical and what the public sector thinks of radical are two very different things. Um, just getting ourselves coordinated, the last four years of being here, I've been working on our strategic planning process, getting our project delivery processes integrated, getting our decision-making processes integrated because we were really a multi-headed Medusa that was kind of doing things all over the place. So having this uh, one all-in-one -one agency makes us now look at all the modes of transport and what can we do to maximize and optimize those modes according to what their outcomes are. And uh, Dr. Shaheen mentioned before, our key objective in this is to – ultimately reduce the growth in auto fleet, private auto car ownership, and private auto car usage. And to do that, we have to do a multiplicity of things um, that include um, what we're talking about today. But it's more than just that. The reason why we're doing this is, is because we as a city are growing uh, for the first time in, in a couple of decades, and the region as a whole has been growing much faster than the city. And for our, under the state law of, of SB 375, we have this thing where we have to do a sustainable community strategy, which is basically how are we going to grow more sustainably as a city and a region. So the regional government, which is the, the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, has been working with the Association of Bay Area Governments. Folks who are not familiar with this, it's acronym SOUP, so I'm going to steer clear of the acronyms, but there's a regional housing agency that, that represents the cities, and there's a regional transportation agency that is the de facto uh, federal government and state government, if you will, for, for the area. They both have worked together and said that, you know, based on the growth for the Bay Area, we think that San Francisco's share is about 15% more people and about 25% more jobs. We took that information with the city plan department and said, okay, the city plan department said the best place for us to grow is in the northeastern part of the city because that has the most um, uh, transit opportunities. It's also the area that can handle the growth, and it's also the other politically <coughs> because it's not just what can you do, it's what can you pass through the, the politics because things are capital expensive or political expensive, and if they're both capital and political expensive, they don't get built. Um, and this is where the city planning has basically figured out and said this is the best place for us to, to grow. So we've looked at that with them and said, wow, if you're going to grow in these areas, which is the most congested parts of our transportation network, we have to do some very different things um, than our status quo. So we have to really have a much more focused uh, growth uh, attempt at looking at how to manage demand, which is our, our key, key metric here. So... Uh, what we looked at is we just finished our strategic plan, which if you go to sfmta.com and look at strategic plan, it has our 2013 to 2018 strategic plan, and we have our overarching metric, which is our, our modal outcomes. 
for us to sh- to to meet the demand of of this growth in the next five to six years, we have to figure out uh, a shift from from driving to more transit, more walking, more bicycling, and everything else. Um, and that basically, our board said we want you to focus on a 50-50 mode share split by 2018, which is again for those who don't understand this, this is very radical for a public uh, entity to do this uh, in the U.S. So that meant an 11% shift from autos over to what we call collective transport, which is transit, walking, bicycling, and, and um, taxi ride sharing, that sort of stuff. So to do that, what do we have to do? Well, we have to do things very differently from today. We have to basically look at this, the reality. The reality is we have about 375,000 registered vehicles in San Francisco, which for a city of, of 800,000 people is pretty good. We have less than <coughs> 50% vehicle um, ownership. But that's not that's not enough because we're going to experience a 30% increase in trips over today. And if we do nothing, if we do business as usual, which again is pretty radical for the rest of the U.S., we're going to see most of those 30% increase in trips wanting to be car trips. And so, how are we going to motivate those car trips? So, somewhere between where we're heading towards now and where we want to be as a as a potential target. We have to reduce our fleet of private vehicles at, at, by f- at least 15%, up to 25%, in order to be able to just physically move around the city. That, that's a huge um, lift for any uh, public agency, level in the city, to, to take that on. So what we've realized is that, of course, we have to build a better and more robust transit network, uh, but that, that takes time, um, and we, we're going through this process now of, of upgrading our existing transit network, so doing more with, with what we have. But we're realizing that there's a real need for a significant densification of vehicle sharing, bicycle sharing, taxi, and, and ride sharing. That really has to, to come forward. The key is how, how much, when, and, and, and where is really the, the challenge that we're faced with. So um, one of the things we look at is we've developed this framework where we're redefining uh, what most people think of transportation demand management, which is a lot of stuff that Dr. Shaheen uh, talked about. Um, we're taking on a much broader role. We're, we're saying, okay, land use is the major trigger of trips. We need to work closer with our land use agencies and really look at how to focus these developments to be much more uh, transit, bicycle, and walking oriented. We need to really take on the issue of parking supply, People tend to drive because there is a parking opportunity at the beginning of the trip and at the end of the trip. If we if we manage those in a more effective way, it signals um, shifts over to uh, to more uh, collective transportation. But people can't shift modes if there's nothing for them to shift into. So transit in San Francisco is very well utilized. It's uh, it's, it's utilized at as high as it is in Manhattan. So we're at capacity. So we can't tell people to take more transit if they physically can't get on. So we have to look at the, the right-of-way, making sure that our, we, our facilities are dedicated, and then looking at our vehicle fleets as well. So how does ride-sharing increase occupancy per vehicle? How does vehicle sharing focus on ownership of, 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 of vehicles? And within that milieu is the, all that we're talking about today, you know, transit and taxis, van and carpooling, shuttles, local and regional shuttles, one-way and two-way car sharing, bike sharing, and scooter sharing. We have all of those things right now in San Francisco. So all of this here. And then one area that no one talks about much is, is how can we manage freight and, and uh, commercial deliveries because it's a huge impact on congestion and how people move around. So that's another thing that we'll be, we'll be talking about. But the three, the, the red, green, and the orange, really don't work unless we have this really good uh, focused customer information platform. And Ever since um, the 90s and, and the early 2000s, that's where everything was falling down. We just couldn't get that information out there. Well, now with social media tools, uh, much more opportunities with um, payment options and all sorts of stuff. Um, contests have come up more to get people access to this information. There's a concept called gamification where creating games actually gives you a more incentive than having this big stick saying, you should ride share, you should carpool, you should take transit. Uh, we're, we're starting to toy, play with all of these things to figure out what's the most effective. And then really having comprehensive evaluation and analysis, like how are you really going to meet these needs? Do these things actually reduce vehicle ownership in the end? Do they reduce the need to drive all the time? Um, is there a transitional phase where there actually is an increase in driving because now there's a new uh, uh, product brought to market that the customers like that may eventually uh, peter off in, in the end? to reduce uh, auto ownership. These are things that we're struggling with because a lot of this stuff is so new, we haven't tested it, and 
my advice to anybody who's listening who wants to play in this space, you have to have good baseline data and you have to be able to share that information through a third-party analysis, not through your own analysis because you're not going to get the um, – people are not going to believe you. So that's a real – that's a real challenge with the evaluation analysis to make sure that things are happening and being evaluated and that you're having information um, evaluated by a third party. So here are the six major tools that we're looking at right now. Better mixed land use, looking at parking demand pricing to, to really manage that demand and focus it towards shifting modes. Better customer information tools, um, looking at the lower <laughs> public transit and ride sharing more effectively and then uh, better and more com comprehensive active transportation facilities, and then really focusing our partnership on, on vehicle sharing and how we can have more vehicle sharing. As you can see, there's no one thing that will actually deal with this growing burden of, of more, more and more car use. And, you know, we've got to, we've got to do all of these uh, simultaneously. So one of the things that we're working on specifically is making making sure our data is as open as possible, that it's accessible as possible, so it's cleaned up so that people can actually create apps that give people the information they want. But the fact of the matter is right now um, uh, two-thirds of the population in San Francisco are, um, have phones. Uh, we've been told anecdotally by the uh, telecom providers that the, the amount of smartphones is increasing, but it's still somewhere around that 50% mark. So 50% don't have smartphones. So that's that's one accessibility issue. The other thing as well is that people don't have – not everybody has credit cards, and I think that's going to change um, as we um, have different forms of payment. So not just having the travel choices and the information, but the payment options, having those three things coordinated is really going to be a key measurement in the ability for this to be brought out to, 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 the, to the mass and having it taken up. You know, ride-sharing options are increasing. Um, the reason why these uh, shuttles, these regional shuttles, are proliferating throughout San Francisco is because two things. The employees are sick and tired of their employees coming to work sick and tired. They're, they're just exhausted from the commutes. So the shuttle, so the companies basically were not willing to move to San Francisco, and the employees were not willing to move down to the South Bay. So they had to do this compromise where the employers are funding their own shuttles to bring people down. That's doing two things. It's creating this car-free lifestyle opportunity for people who are choosing to live and to stay in San Francisco, but it's also reducing the amount of congestion on the 101 corridor down to San Francisco. Caltrain's already full. We need to beef up Caltrain, but in the meantime, these services are, are really helping out. Bike sharing is also helping out because it's going to help create that first and last mile opportunity with these with these services. But still not enough. You know, there's still latent demand that we need to meet. Rideshare vans are growing. Um, there's all these different companies that are popping up, and they kind of meet a different demand as well, but they've been traditionally focusing on the, the commute period only. Um, here is just a quick look at we do a, we, We're doing a muni partners program with the shuttles to figure out what is their benefit. And, you know, they've displaced about... Uh, 50 million uh, annual VMT trips already just by from the surveying the, the riders who use this. Um, and there's also a, a, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So these are pretty significant things, and, you know, one-fifth of the people who have been using these have basically shed a car. They've, they've given up needing a car. So I think it's been it's important, but there's also people who haven't changed their behavior beyond the commute trip. So, you know, we, we, it's still in, it's still, we're still analyzing and still figuring this out. And then lastly, with the vehicle sharing options, you know, they, they are increasing a lot. Um, there are proliferation of peer-to-peer of -peer and uh, one-way and two-way car sharing. Bike sharing is starting this summer. Um, these things are growing uh, a lot. And then on, on the ride-sharing side, you know, scooters started, which is the, the vehicle sharing for scooters. Taxis have been growing. You know, the, one of the things that we will, we'll talk about is, you know, the, the, you know, the sidecar and the lift. What they've basically shown is that there's this huge untapped demand, and, um, you know, serving those markets is going to be very important. Um, we're looking at increasing taxi uh, volumes in the city, trying to improve their, their, the way that they're deployed, trying to improve the way that, that payment or options are happening so they can meet some of those needs. And then there's other vehicle sharing options with freight. So I'm going to basically wrap up there and, and say that, there's a lot going on right now. Um, everything is in real time. Um, we're beholden to the to the CPUC ruling on what they're going to decide to do. There are some things that we're going to try and do to improve um, uh, access to these services from our end. 
Um, I'll just put in a plug and say, you know, look at our Facebook page, like us on Facebook, sfmta.mini. That's really where we're going to be um, having more and more of this kind of information. <laughs> we um, update our website as well, which is sfmta.com. So that's where I'm at. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Timothy, for that. Um, and we only have a limited time. Then there's a there's a number of questions that have been asked, but I think they all seem to, and uh, so I'll sort of try to put them all together because I think this is something that uh, maybe all of uh, our panelists may want to speak to. Um, uh, and that is, you know, the question of you know, what is ride sharing and whether or not you know, wh why is it that, uh, as I think those. Uh, all, all of our panelists have said that uh, these new type of services are filling some kind of unmet need. Is it, is it uh, just technology um, and that people want technology and that the nonprofit ride sharing um, industry is not able to provide that? Or is there something more here that is driving these new kind of companies and their growth? Which either distinguishes themselves from ride sharing, traditional ride sharing, or is breaking new ground um, and offering a different kind of service entirely. I don't know if you want to address that, maybe Sunil, since you sort of are one of the sure. proponents and uh, you have your company. Sure, I think a, a common misperception is that technology equals innovation. Technology doesn't equal innovation. Innovation is, you know, rethinking the way things are done. Technology is a tool to enable that innovation. And what we're doing with Sidecar is a, a different way of thinking about uh, ride sharing, about uh, access and mobility, um, and it's certainly enabled by uh, technology. You, know, you can make the same case for, for car sharing. Uh, you know, the, the, the technology that, for example, is being used for peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, that's not the interesting innovation. The, the idea that you can, I mean, that technology has been around really since car sharing, or at least technology-enabled car sharing has been around. Uh, what's new is innovations around the business model, innovations around insurance, innovations around, um, uh, at some level, customer acceptance and marketing and getting the message to people in a way that they can understand. Uh, those are all significant innovations, and you can't, um, I think there are some parties out there who say, oh, gosh, all I got to do is add technology to taxes, and you're done. Uh, I, I, that's not the case. I mean, the taxi model is built on uh, a, a way of thinking about, um, it's based on a technology that really 1950s kind of technology, really 1930s technology, the current uh, taxi model was created to, to the business of union busting activity, and it is, in my view, one that is deeply unfair to drivers and mainly accrues to the benefit of the medallion holders, and, um, you know, they're the ones that have the most to lose in, in a change. So, so what do you think about that, Timothy, from a city perspective? I mean, is, is this something that is just a new, you know, form of... Uh, of uh, you know, a better taxi cab service, or is it something that ride sharing and a nonprofit organization should be adopting that's going to enhance the, the way that uh, your platform works, that is, better customer information from the app side, and that uh, it promotes ride sharing? Yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's a combination of a lot of these things. You know, traditionally the ride share organizations have been very myopic, and, and you know, I'm going to be very frank about it. We've all been following our, our modal tails. You know, the transit people run in one direction, the bike people run in one direction, and the ride share people run in another direction. Everyone's like waiting for the, the little dribs and drabs that come from the federal government. And they haven't had this comprehensive view because they haven't had to. And I think now our agency specifically has to look at this comprehensively and what makes sense. Now, for us, whether it's, um, you know, a ride-sharing company, a nonprofit, whoever it is, to us, it comes down to, like, a few things. Is it safe? Is it regulated? Is it, does it meet these criteria? Does it meet equity? Does it meet ADA accessibility? All these things is what we care about the most. And I think you'll see that fold out in the near future with the CPUC hearing and some of the, some of the things that um, we'll probably take on as a city and a region. That's really where our, our concern is. Um, we don't favor or, or hinder things that we think are, uh, are, are going to meet our goals. 
but at the same time, we are very we want to be careful that there that there, there is this social equity and um, public safety element really being at adhered to, and that's that's what I think everybody wants. You know, we we did that with the airline industry, we do it with uh, everything. So I think it's just that's where we're coming from. But absolutely, there is a there is a there is a demand, a gap that has been temporarily filled. Um, the gap is huge for every mode. And people want to move around, and the, and the new generation of people who are living and working in cities do not want to own a car as much as the, the previous generation did. So that means more shared rides. Great. All right. That's uh, great. Well, uh, uh, Susan, I don't know if uh, your voice allows you to jump in here, but, you know, from a research point of view and how you sort of uh, looked at the development of ride sharing, you know, what are the kinds of things you're going to look at uh, going forward to determine what, if anything, new services like Sunil's, uh can contribute to ride sharing, or whether it will, in fact, somehow merge with ride sharing, or is it uh, ride sharing? What are you going to be looking at? To, to well, I, I, thanks, thanks for the question, Larry. Uh, you know, my role as an academic is to, you know, look at things objectively and to do research to really clarify uh, what is happening and. There's a lot of statements out there. It's very unclear to me exactly what's happening. And, you know, I think this is where research can step step in and play a role in terms of clarifying safety impacts, economic impacts, as well as uh, congestion and emission reduction benefits. There's a lot of claims that, you know, ride sharing takes cars off the road, but we don't know. And, and you know, by what order of magnitude does it take cars off the road or does it reduce the VMT? And how do the different models correspond? And another question I think we really need to look at, and Timothy has set us up for this pretty well, is that there's a proliferation of services in the shared use space, you know, well beyond ride sharing. We've got three different models of car sharing. We've got classic uh, car sharing, which is usually used on evenings and weekends. We've got peer-to-peer -peer car sharing systems where people are putting their own cars in. And then we have one-way services where vehicles are taken from one location to the, to the next, and, and several people have claimed that those are actually a form of taxi service. And then we also have public bike sharing. So when you put all of these things into the mix and provide people with all of these choices, how do they collectively come together to affect uh, social and environmental benefits? So I think a lot of research is needed here to help us navigate our way through uh, the complexity of innovation. Great. Well, I think uh, with that, I think we've almost run out of time. We have like a minute, so I'll, I'll use that remaining time to thank our distinguished uh, panelists for their time and effort, uh, Dr. Susan Shaheen, Sunil Paul of Sidecar, and Timothy Papatrio of uh, Muni. And I appreciate everyone's time on the uh, who attended the webinar. And thank you very much, Phil, and uh, the Center for Urban Transportation Research and our other sponsors for supporting this webinar. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.